Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks to each and every one of you for being here today for a talk by Professor Norman Sade entitled Privacy in the Age of AI and the Internet of Things. For those of you who don't already know me, my name is Avery Slater. I'm assistant professor in the Department of English at the University of Toronto and faculty fellow at the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society. Before we begin today's session, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this land is still home to many Indigenous people working to reclaim their rights to self-determination. We're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Although we may all be joining from different places, we invite you to reflect on the history and relations of the land that you're on. A few logistics before we begin. The session is being recorded. Our guests will speak for about 50 to 60 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. Um, if you have burning questions that you wanna ask midway, you can put those in the chat and we'll see if we can get to them. Um, most of the questions will be saved for the end. And during the Q&A, we encourage all participants to uh, join in. You can use the raise hand function in the Zoom meeting controls to ask a question. You can also write questions in the chat. So I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Norman Sade. Norman Sade is professor in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. He is director of CMU's Mobile Commerce Laboratory and its e-supply chain management laboratory, co-founder of the school's PhD program in societal computing, and co-director of the MSIT program in privacy engineering. He also co-founded and directs the MBA track in technology leadership launched jointly by the Tepper School of Business and the School of Computer Science in 2005. Norman's primary research focus has been in the area of mobile and pervasive computing, cybersecurity, online privacy, user-oriented machine learning, and semantic web technologies, with a particular focus on mobile and social networking. He has authored, authored over 200 scientific publications and is author of M Commerce Technology Services and Business Models, a best selling book published by Wiley in April 2002. Norman is well known for his seminal work in AI planning and scheduling, agent based supply chain management, workflow management, automated trading and negotiation, including the original design and launch of the International Supply Chain Trading Agent Competition. Products based on his research have been deployed and commercialized by organizations such as IBM, Raytheon, Mitsubishi, Boeing, Numetrix, ILOG, and the New US Army. His privacy research has been credited with influencing the design of products at companies such as Facebook and Google, as well as activities at the US Federal Trade Commission. Between 2008 and 2011, Professor Sadis served as founding CEO of Wombat Security Technologies, a leading provider of innovative cybersecurity training products and anti-phishing solutions, originally developed as part of research with several of his colleagues at CMU. So uh, without further ado, Naren, the floor is yours. We're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Avery, for, for this nice introduction. And thank you for uh, reading such a long bio. I thought I'd actually send something shorter, but really appreciate it. Let me see if I can share my screen now. And here we go. So good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I'd like to see if we can start uh, with uh, a little bit of an interactive uh, session here. So I'm going to ask you to pretend for a minute, and some of you presumably are students, and so uh, just imagine that you've graduated now and all of a sudden you've got more money and you decide to go ahead and purchase a car. And uh, the first thing that happens when you purchase a car is you've got to go and start shopping around for an insurance uh, company, an insurance policy. And so these insurance policies, they're not necessarily just going to give you a policy like that. They typically want to know a bit more about you, and they might want to ask you a few different questions. And so I'm going to ask you to pretend for a few minutes that you're being asked different questions, and I'm going to ask you to what extent you would feel comfortable 
answering these questions. And I'm not asking you to tell me whether or not companies ask these questions or not today. I believe that the questions that I'm going to ask are reasonable questions that conceivably a, an insurance company, or reasonable is probably not the right term, but are questions that an insurance company could conceivably ask you. And, uh, and uh, just because those questions are correlated in some manner to uh, your risk uh, for them, risk of crashing, and also how bad those crashes might be. So uh, imagine, for instance, that uh, the insurance company that you talk to would like to know how fast you drive. And so I'm going to ask you to answer with a yes or no um, uh, answer. Uh, just let me know how comfortable you would be providing this information. I hope that uh, many of you uh, decide uh, to participate. Ideally, all of you, all 50 of you uh, would participate. So please raise your hand if you'd be comfortable sharing this information or give me a yes. And uh, please, uh, you know, give me a thumbs down or a no if you're not comfortable with that. And I'll try to tabulate as, as best as I can uh, the results. Okay, I'd like to see a few more answers. I've got eight right now. That's not very much. Uh, you know, we've got uh, a lot more people. I see that there are some things in the chat. Let me see what people are asking in the chat. Um, let's see. Okay, so tabulating in a chat is a lot more difficult. I'm just going to eyeball it here. I think I see slightly more yeses than noes, and that seems to also be consistent with the answers I'm getting. So please do not answer in the chat if you can. Please use the reactions uh, instead. So I see a, um, I would say just eyeballing this because it's hard to tabulate. I would say maybe two thirds of you are saying yes and perhaps one third are saying no. And I'm going to quickly erase all that. So let me just uh, get rid of this, assuming that I've got the right to do this. Yes, I do. So, and so from now on, please use, don't use the chat to answer because that's impossible to tabulate. But uh, let's, uh, you know, perhaps uh, you've been very nice with me, by the way. I looked at the chat because I thought somebody would say, well, exactly what do you mean? by you know how fast you drive. So assume that it's going to be self-reported. So they say, tell me how fast you drive, right? Do you respect the speed limit, yes or no? How many of you would feel comfortable answering that question? So now that I've clarified a bit the context, let's see what the answers are. I would like to see more answers. And by the way, there's no right or wrong answer. So do not feel like you've got to copy what everybody else is saying. Feel free to disagree with the majority of people. Um, all right, I would have liked to see more answers, but in the interest of time, I'm, I'm gonna call it here. So most of you have said yes, but I know that uh, at least one person doesn't feel comfortable uh, with uh, providing that information. So now, obviously, uh, you know, the next question would be to ask you about your driving record and your speeding tickets. But I'm going to skip this one also in the interest of time. Perhaps you can just uh, try to answer that question in your head. And um, then let's get to the next one. So uh, I don't know about Canada, but certainly here in the US, there are a bunch of insurance companies that you know, offer you discounts. If you're willing to install a GPS unit in your car, that's going to be reporting on your driving habits, including whether or not you're speeding. And so I'd be curious, and so that's only happening in the US. I'd be curious to know how many of you would feel comfortable uh, with that idea for yourself, obviously. Yeah, I'd like to get a few more answers if I can. Right. So now all of a sudden the tide has turned and I'm seeing uh, 13 no's or 14 no's and, and five yeses. So clearly under those assumptions, people are feeling a bit less comfortable uh, with uh, this idea. And then obviously I could go on and I could say, well, what if, you know, they didn't collect this data directly, you know, from that GPS unit, but what if they collected this data by acquiring it from data brokers who perhaps are collecting this data through a bunch of different apps on your smartphone. And we could go on and ask the, you know, many variations of these questions. So I'm not asking you to answer that question. I'm just gonna move on to the next one right now, uh, just again in the interest of time. So suppose that, uh, you know, another key question, as I'm sure you realize, 
uh, you know, a major cause of accidents has to do with lack of sleep. When you sleep less, you're less responsive, right? And and that creates more crashes, and the crashes tend to also get worse. So how many of you would feel comfortable disclosing how many hours they sleep at night? And so please raise your hand if you'd be okay with that. Okay, I'd like to get a few more responses if I can. All right. So this is roughly evenly split. I see um, eight or nine no's and seven yeses, eight yeses now. So pretty evenly split. I don't know if you can guess the next variation of this question, but uh, just in case, uh, let me spell it out. So how about based on information collected by your smartphone, your smartwatch? I'm going to actually erase first the, uh, the answers here so you can start from scratch. So how many of you would feel comfortable uh, basically with an insurance company that said, you know, we might give you a discount, but you would really need to, you know, allow us to collect this data from your smartphone, your smartwatch, your activity bracelet. And obviously that might include some AI and machine learning also to process this. So any takers on this one? So um, glad to see that there's at least one person who sleeps well. I'm sorry to hear about the others. Actually, I see two people who would be okay with that, or three, I'm sorry, keeps on changing. Three and and then uh, fourteen to fifteen nodes. Okay, so uh, by and large, the majority of you don't seem to be super comfortable uh, with this idea. And uh, then obviously, maybe we try the last one just to to see. So let me clear. So can anyone guess the the last uh, the the last variation on this question? I'm gonna erase all the uh, all the the feedback here. So the last variation is how about, you know, information collected through sensors in your bed sheets. This stuff exists. I'm not making this up, right? This stuff actually exists. So I'd like to see how many of you would be okay with that. One person, nice. Okay, we're gonna stop here. Thank you for participating. So let's reflect a bit on what we've learned here. Uh, and so I've tried to make a few different points. So one thing I believe, and you know, there might be an exception. I saw one person saying yes uh, pretty often, but I'm not completely sure. But most of us, potentially all of us, typically all of you, I've not. I could easily ask you a few more questions, and it could eventually become all of you. All of us really have reservations, at least about a subset of these scenarios. So good news, everyone cares about privacy. So yeah, privacy is not dead. But that's not the main point I'm trying to make, although it's an important point in case you had any doubts. So the next point that I really wanted to make is not everyone feels the same way about this scenario. So if all of us felt the same way about each one of these scenarios, privacy would be easy, right? You would have laws that said, this is okay, this is not okay, end of the story. But the fact that we don't all feel the same way about these things, and the fact that you yourself may not even feel the same way about this question if I were to ask it to you again tomorrow, Right, makes it make, makes privacy very challenging, as it turns out, and uh, uh, and uh, it's not just what is collected, but it's also how it is collected, whether or not you're aware of that collection, whether you've provided consent, at what level of precision, for what purpose, who it might be shared with. All these different considerations actually have an impact on whether or not you're feeling comfortable with these scenarios, and then obviously, uh, you know, none of what I presented here is science fiction. Uh, you know, these scenarios are actually happening as we speak. Not sure about the one in, with the, the bed sheets. The sensors in the bed sheets do exist, mainly as uh, technologies to help you sleep better. But nothing says that, you know, this data could not be sold to a data broker and eventually find its way into information that uh, your insurance company uh, might uh, decide that they would like to purchase at some point. Insurance companies love to get a lot of information. They like to get to get it right and to figure what, what your actual risk is. And so because of this, right, uh, a big part of privacy involves informing people and giving them some choices. And, you know, I'm not going to go into turn this into a lecture about privacy laws and, and regulations, but there is a collection of principles that people refer to as fair information practices principles that are found across all the privacy laws around the world. So you find them in uh, PIPEDA, you find them in Europe with GDPR, you find them in California with CCP and elsewhere. And those fair information practice principles uh, include in particular the idea 
that if you're going to be collecting data from people and you want to act as good stewards of that data, you will want to provide people with some kind of notification. Tell them what data you collect about them, ideally for what purpose, for how long you go retain it, who you might be sharing it with, and so on. And ideally, you would like to give them some choices. And those choices vary a lot. So the interpretation of these principles vary a lot from one law to another. Uh, in Europe, they tend to go with what is referred to as opt-in or consent. That means that most collection scenarios cannot take place unless you've got explicit and informed consent from people whose data is going to be collected, the so-called data subjects. In the US, we tend to err more on the so-called opt-out side of the world, where it's basically the idea that you can collect whatever you want until the user decides to provide, to say, hey, please stop. And that's called opting out. And, and so one of the things that has happened over the past few years, uh, especially over the past five years, but if you look at Pipeda, obviously the latest overhaul was in 2015. One of the things that has happened over the past few years is the introduction of increasingly stringent regulations that spell out these requirements at a finer level. So obviously, the uh, you know the big event in this space was uh, in 2018 when the European General Data Protection Regulation came into place. That law has had an impact across the world with most countries revising their privacy laws in some way to uh, basically reflect some of these uh, more stringent requirements. Obviously, not everyone has followed the same approach. We in the US, in, in fact, are actually quite different, and we have no federal law that's similar to GDPR. We have state laws like the California Consumer Privacy Right Act, uh, and uh, but nothing at the federal level that's similar to GDPR. But one of the things about these new privacy laws, and this is you know what motivates a lot of our work, is the fact that they've required people to be much more specific about what data they collect, for what purpose, for how long they retain the data, who they share the data with, uh, and uh, also requiring companies who collect data to provide end users, data subjects, people whose data has been collected with more controls. The ability to opt in, the ability to opt out of different types of practices, collection of different types of data, different ways of processing that data, and so on. And so in many ways, Right, this is all moving in the right direction until you realize that you know the ways in which these things are implemented in practice, the notice side, for instance, of notice and choice is typically implemented in the form of privacy policies. And I'm not gonna do a show of hands here because it's gonna to be too depressing. But if I were to ask you, you know, if you've read a privacy policy over the past month, unless you really work in privacy, and even if you work in privacy, it's not guaranteed, I will probably get very few hands. I've asked these questions many, many times. I see somebody who raised their hand. So really glad to see that some people have read the text of a privacy policy uh, over the past month. Uh, the next question, by the way, when I get a yes, is to say, but did you actually understand everything that that privacy said, policy said? And inevitably the answer is no. And even if it's no, and you tell me yes, I would argue that it's probably no. Perhaps you believe you've answered, understood, but chances are you have not. We've done a lot of research on that. and. Uh, it's extremely difficult to actually understand what privacy policies say. And so, you know, only in fantasy lands really do privacy policies really work. And so, you know, these new regulations, which in a way require people to disclose more details, have actually had, have had you know, almost the opposite effect. Because if you look at the length of these privacy policies, GDPR by and large uh, is believed to have increased the length of typical privacy policies by about 25%. So if you're not reading these policies before, what are the chances that you're reading them now, right? And all these beautiful privacy choices that are now required, right, by, by uh, new regulations. Well, guess what? They've resulted in an explosion of privacy settings. And, you know, I could ask you, you know, whether or not you've looked at the privacy settings on your cell phone recently, whether you know all these settings, whether you're comfortable with them. The quick answer is the vast majority of people do not even know that these settings exist. The vast majority of people just don't have the time, the motivation to play with these settings. And so the, the, the conclusion here is that while we've made great progress over the past few years in terms of regulating this space, these regulations are still highly unrealistic in terms of what people can actually do, what people can realistically be expected to do, right? And so at the end of the day, there's a real human bottleneck here that's not yet properly addressed.
this lack of expertise, the fact that we're unable to read privacy policies, even if we're paid and actually understand what they say, a lack of time, obviously, who's got the time to read all these privacy policies, a lack of attention. Privacy is known as a secondary task, which means that you're always doing something else that in your mind tends to be more important as you make privacy decisions. For instance, downloading that mobile app so that you can start playing that video game your friends have told you about, that's your primary task. Those privacy settings, those privacy considerations, you tend to dismiss that. There are a variety of different cognitive and behavioral biases that have been studied that show that people tend to discount these things and dismiss those long-term consequences that are a lot less obvious. And so there's a very, very big challenge in this space. And we've been asking ourselves, uh, as well as others, right, have been asking themselves, well, how can we alleviate this situation? And part of this obviously involves probably coming up with even more stringent requirements. And if you look at regulations, and I've been, you know, saying that they're not that great, if you look at GDPR, you look at CCPA, CPRA, these regulations actually do have some provisions for trying to overcome these challenges. They require, CCPA, for instance, requires you to make opt-out choices more visible, and they require you to do other things that are increasing a little bit the usability. But we're very, very far from actually bridging the break, uh, you know, overcoming the bridge between the gap between what is required in these regulations and what people can really, really do. And so at the end of the day, when you think about this at a high level, you can try to come up with technologies that will help people uh, overcome these challenges. You can try to come up with regulations, inform public policies, and we do a lot of that based on our research. We're trying to see how far we can go to technologies, but we also tell regulators, look, there's a limit as to how far you can go here. Perhaps the regulations need to be more specific about how some of these things are going to be done, how you're going to present this information, how you're going to expose these choices to users. And there's a need to obviously educate the public. I'm not going to talk about that last part very much today, but I'll talk about the other two uh, parts uh, and how our research over the years has attempted to contribute to these two different approaches to alleviating uh, some of these uh, challenges. So uh, one line of work that we've been engaged in for a little over 10 years now uh, is effectively about answering the question, what if computers understood the text of privacy policies? If people don't have the time or motivation to read privacy policies, could we somehow get computers to do this for them? And if we did, what sort of functionality could we start offering people that could potentially help them regain control over their data do a better job at regaining a sense of, of, of control over their data. And so going back, you know, 10 years ago, the sorts of things that we're doing, uh, this was all before Gen AI, is would recruit uh, annotators, typically people with a legal background, and would ask them to annotate privacy policies, identify different types of disclosures in these privacy policies. You see here different colors being used to uh, basically represent different types of data practices identified in the text of the privacy policy. So what is represented here to the right in that vertical bar is actually a full privacy policy with different segments of this policy and different colors being used to represent different types of disclosures, disclosures related to what is referred to as first party collection, meaning what is this site, in this case, the New Yorker, telling us about what data they collect and for what purpose, third party sharing collection in this color here in green, what does this privacy policy say about, you know, who data is being shared with, uh, what types of user choices are available, and so on. And so we, we collected a lot of these annotations and over time build uh, increasingly sophisticated uh, classifiers to see whether we could automatically read the text of policies and recognize these types of statements. And uh, achieving actually, even before Gen AI, a fairly decent accuracy on uh, many different types of practices. Obviously, some questions and some issues are easier to automatically identify than others. And I'll discuss that a bit more in a few minutes. Uh, but those are the kinds of things that we did. And then at some point, we uh, published a website where people could navigate about 7,000 different privacy policies that we had automatically annotated with our classifiers. And, and so that was fun. Uh, we certainly got a good amount of press uh, coverage. I like this one because, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, really interesting. So this was by Fast Company, and they had an article in the bottom part of the, the, the website here. You're never going to read that privacy policy. Could AI help? And they were talking about our technology. But interestingly enough, they had just changed their privacy policy also. And so above that, they had, we have updated our privacy policy, which I thought was uh, fairly ironic. So I'd like to show this slide. Uh, so in a way, 
uh, showing how useful perhaps this sort of technology could could be, but also uh, the fact that even though they were writing articles about us, they had not necessarily changed their practices. So how about building really practical tools based on the ability to automatically understand the text of privacy policy? So what are the kinds of things that we can do? Well, one of the early things that we built uh, was, for instance, a, um, a technology in the form of a browser extension, which is actually available today in the Google Chrome uh, store. So you can basically download it and, and install it on, on in your Google uh, Chrome uh, browser. Uh, this extension will automatically read the text of privacy policies of websites that you connect to and will automatically identify opt-out choices that are basically buried deep in the text of these privacy policies. Basically, companies abiding by regulatory requirements where they're being told, look, people have to be given that choice. They've got to be able to opt out of this or that. Right, like opting out of uh, you know being spammed with email, opting out of uh, having your data being sold or what have you. But you know if these choices are very deep in a privacy policy and nobody reads a privacy policy, this amounts to not doing anything in fact. And so with this browser extension, we can actually identify uh, you know more than ninety percent of the time our uh, choices that are being offered. We can classify these choices and then we can present them to users in a way in which they can readily take advantage of them. So this is what this uh, uh, extension uh, looks like. So these are examples of simple technologies that you can very quickly develop if you've got technology that can read privacy policies. But we've gone a lot beyond that. Uh, so for instance, one thing that we quickly realized is that you know if you can read the text of privacy policies automatically, and perhaps you have access to the code of a technology such as mobile apps, for instance. So mobile apps, Android apps in particular, they're basically Java code. They're pretty easy to decompile. And so what if I could you know, compare the code of a mobile app with the privacy policy of that mobile app and potentially look for discrepancies, right? Or look for statements that are not necessarily compliant with what the regulations require. If I could do that, then automatically I would be able to do automated compliance analysis. And that could be very useful. It could be useful for regulators, which hardly have any resources to do this thing. These things. It could be useful for app stores, right? Which definitely bear some responsibility for all these apps that they publish. It could also be useful for developers themselves before they get in trouble with the law, you know, help them identify potential compliance issues because their privacy policy doesn't do a good job at disclosing some of these practices. And so uh, we've done that. And uh, you know, we actually ran in uh, 2018 an analysis of over a million apps on the Google Play Store, a million and 35,000 apps. And, um, you know, what did we discover? Well, we discovered that about over 600,000 of those, that, 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 that number of a million apps, over 600,000 of those apps were likely non-compliant. We could not tell for sure. You always need to vet these results manually, double check the code, double check manually that you know your classifier did the right job at identifying those disclosures or lack of disclosures uh and we did that actually for obviously a subset of those million apps we could not manually vet uh, the analysis for million apps but we actually did vet that with some regulators worked with the uh, federal trade commission for instance and also the california attorney general and uh in fact discovered that this analysis was pretty accurate on average an app had about 3.47 uh, uh, regulatory uh, compliance, potential compliance issues, median was about three. So that gives you a, a sense for how useful this sort of technology can be. And in fact, nowadays, uh, you've got uh, a company like Google, for instance, has a, a product that they've developed uh, that's based in part on, on this research. And um, Google actually funded some of this work uh, at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so we've shared results with regulators. We've also helped uh, companies use this tool to find issues before it was too late. And uh, nowadays, some of these tools are being commercialized and also used by the regulators. What's interesting is when you look uh, you know, at uh, these, these types of analysis on a large scale, you can quickly zoom in also on what it is that mobile app developers struggle with the most. And our analysis has systematically shown that in the case of mobile apps, what people struggle with the most when it comes to properly disclosing their practices is the use of third-party libraries. So uh, developers have a terrible time understanding what is a third-party library, understanding that often when you know they share data with these third-party libraries, uh, that sharing has to be disclosed in, in their privacy policy, like disclose sharing your location. 
even something as simple as an app collecting the location of a user, for instance, and then displaying that location on Google Maps, even if it's an Android app, and in the mind of developers, it's all Google. But in truth, it is not, right? So Google Maps is a third party. If you're going to be displaying that location information in Google Maps, that is something that you've got to disclose in your privacy policy. And so that's a, a very, very big source of confusion for developers, as it turns out. And we found all sorts of other things and uh, encourage app store operators to provide better support to developers. The developers, uh, there are tons of them. This is the beauty of, of the mobile app ecosystem. They've made an environment, they created an environment where it's very easy for random people to start building apps. Unfortunately, for most of these people who don't have much experience, many of them building their first app and then publishing uh, that app, uh, success means code that doesn't crash. And so privacy is not really something that they think very much about. And so we've been encouraging and worked actually with some app stores to uh, basically tell them that, look, at the end of the day, you are the more sophisticated organization here. You have a responsibility to provide better support to these developers and uh, with, with some success. We've also built ourselves tools to help developers. So obviously, if you can start looking at the code of a mobile app and you can understand what this app does, they not why not you know help uh, developers build their privacy policy? And so we've built tools to do that. We've done the same things for privacy labels. So privacy labels are an interesting development, actually directly influenced uh, from research by research at Carnegie Mellon. So uh, my uh, collaborators and I uh, over the years have worked on our privacy labels. The idea originated with my colleague, Laurie Craner, and a PhD student that we co-advised. And in particular, we showed that if mobile apps had privacy labels, basically labels that similar to nutrition labels, would provide succinct summary of the data that's being collected by an app and what is being done with that data, people would be much more likely to pay attention. This would be much easier for them to look at than reading the full text of privacy policy. And at the end of the day, you'd be likely to help them a lot more than just telling them, hey, follow the link and read the privacy policy. Good luck. Right. Uh, but the problem, obviously, is, again, developers are not very good when it comes to understanding privacy. And just like they're not doing a very good job at writing privacy policies or hiring lawyers to help them pri write privacy policies, which is the better way to go here, by the way, uh, they're not doing a very good job at uh, defining privacy labels. And so we've built a tool that's actually available for developers. If I had time, I would show you a video of how that tool works. But basically, that tool is going to be looking at your code, and then it's going to systematically walk you through a number of different questions to help ensure that the privacy labels that you uh, create are in fact consistent with what your code does. And so those are all examples of things that we've done. As I've mentioned, privacy labels themselves uh, you know, are a big part of trying to simplify the notice process in notice and choice. Uh, this is research that originated at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we published a paper in 2013 with the PhD student that we uh, uh, co-advised, Laurie and I, uh, and that paper basically showed that if mobile apps, you know, had labels, this could make a very big difference for users and it would end up probably making very different types of privacy decisions. And in 2019, fall of 2018, we got a call from Apple saying, hey, we read your papers. We like the idea. We're going to go ahead and, and, and deploy that. So that's another way in which your research has actually influenced uh, some of the things that uh, you find uh, out there. And then obviously being who we are as researchers, as soon as, uh, iOS started to introduce uh, privacy labels in its app store. We said, but are these privacy labels accurate? Or, you know, are there potentially some problems? And very quickly, there was anecdotal evidence showing that, you know, obviously uh, developers probably struggled, uh, you know, struggled, they struggle creating those labels. And so we could not help. We had to do our own analysis of these privacy labels, compare again, uh, for instance, the text of the privacy policy with what the privacy labels disclosed. And without you know going into all sorts of details, and now we're using obviously Gen AI uh, technologies and LLMs, uh, we're able to build technology that's uh, pretty accurate to over ninety percent. And uh, obviously, uh, the analysis showed that a very large number of apps again are not doing such a great job with their privacy labels. We differentiate between two different types of inconsistencies. One is the label doesn't seem to be disclosing uh, all the practices that are being disclosed in the privacy policy. That is not necessarily such a big deal because as it turns out, privacy policies often apply to more than just one app or they might apply to the app and a website. But what is uh, a lot more alarming 
is situations where the privacy policy is incomplete and doesn't include disclosures that the privacy label indicate the uh, app that 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 uh, that indicate that the app engages in some practices, but those practices are not disclosed in a privacy policy. And about a quarter of the apps that we analyzed seem to have that uh, issue. So again, an indication that better tools are required for developers. Developers, the, these ecosystems that you know have emerged over the past fifteen years that have been key to the success of smartphones. Right, the idea was. Let's create so many apps that any user out there will find you know, 50 or 100 apps that they find very compelling. They're gonna to wanna to download these apps and they're gonna to wanna to obviously buy a smartphone and update their smartphones on a regular basis to take advantage of the latest features and the latest APIs. Well, that's beautiful, but as you do that and you lower the bar for these developers, it's inevitable that you're basically opening the door to two guys in a garage who've got no idea about privacy, don't have the means to hire a lawyer, and so at the end of the day, from my perspective, the owners goes back to the app store and they're the more sophisticated organization. They've got to provide better support to developers to do, to do a better job. So another question that we ask about these privacy labels is, so Apple came up with its own implementation. It's not like they followed exactly what we described in our paper. And so we could not help but ask also, well, to what extent do these privacy labels really answer people's privacy questions, right? So the idea, obviously about having these labels is that people no longer need to read the privacy policy. Instead, they can just look at the labels and figure answers to the questions that they have. That only works obviously to the extent that those labels do answer those questions, right? And so we uh, did a careful analysis of both labels introduced in the iOS app store and labels introduced about nine months later by uh, Google in the Google Play store. And uh, we compare that with a corpus of privacy questions that people have about their mobile apps, the corpus that we had uh, basically collected as part of our research. And uh, as it turns out, it's not terrible, but uh, when you look at iOS, uh, you're basically, I'm sorry, when you look at uh, uh, Android, uh, you find that uh, it's the, the labels that Android uh, offers probably answer about 43, 44% of the typical questions that uh, mobile app users have. And iOS about 39.5, 40% of those questions. If you want to do a finer analysis, and I'm not going to go into the details, you find that there are major differences. So Google does a much better job at uh, disclosing how apps deal with security. Uh, iOS does a much better job when it comes to disclosing whether or not uh, data that's been collected is potentially being sold and shared with different uh, players. And so, now you've got to ask yourself, well, if these labels only answer about 40, 45, maybe even 50 for a generous percent of the questions that people have, you know, is that satisfactory? Or, and, and you know, is it okay to say, well, you know, people will still have to go back to the privacy policy 50% of the time if they really want to get an answer to that question, or more likely as we know, because nobody has the time to read these privacy policies, they will just not get an answer to their question. And so that has motivated our work that we've been doing now for the past six or seven years, on privacy question answering. And so the idea, very much along the lines of uh, Gen AI, ChatGPT, uh, although uh, some of these technologies did not exist when we started this work, uh, the idea is, uh, well, if the privacy labels are only going to go so far in answering questions that people have about their privacy, how about developing technology that allows people to ask any question that's on their mind and get an answer without having to read the text of the privacy policy? And so, Questions that you might have might be something like, can I opt out of having my location shared with advertisers? Or is there a way I can review and delete my data, right? Those are typical types of questions. Uh, and uh, we've actually been able to develop technology that does a pretty decent job at answering a broad range of questions. And obviously with LLMs and, and Gen AI, we're continuing to make uh, a lot of progress within that space, but there are also limits to how far these tools can go today. And as it turns out, Privacy policies, as I said, are not that easy to read and uh, to understand, even for Gen AI tools. Uh, for instance, in the context of privacy, if you read the text of a privacy policy, which is the basis for obviously our privacy answering functionality, there is a lot of reliance on uh, pseudonyms, hypernames, hypernames, right? So for instance, you might have a privacy policy that talks about GPS data, but the user asked a question about whether or not their location was being collected. Gen AI will typically know that GPS and location are related. So that's an easy one. 
But the privacy policy, on the other hand, might talk about the fact that the app collects your whereabouts. No, is that your location? Yes or no? There's a good chance that this actually means your location. Is GenAI able to make that connection? Most of the time, it's not. Or, you know, how about, you know, answering a question about, does this app collect, you know, health information about me? And the app somewhere discloses that it collects data about how you commute to work, such as driving versus biking. But is that health information? Yes or no? And as you can see here, very quickly, we get into a gray area where you might need to even make some assumptions about what is legitimate health information, what is not. And so uh, when you ask those types of questions to Gen AI uh, tools today, they have no clue. Uh, but the biggest challenge for Gen AI has to do with the fact that privacy policies, which are written by lawyers typically, right, are doing a very good job at only disclosing the things that you are required to disclose by law. And so most of these privacy policies tend to be silent about all sorts of different issues because the law doesn't require them to necessarily disclose explicitly what they do in that regard. It's actually very interesting to see how people read the text of these privacy policies. Uh, most of the time when you ask someone, does this app engage in this practice and the policy is silent, people will say, well, it doesn't say anything about it, therefore it must not engage in that practice. The correct answer is it depends. If the jurisdiction that you know, you're falling under requires this app to disclose that they're engaging in this practice if they do, and the policy is silent, then the implication is that probably they are not engaging in that practice because if they did, they would have to disclose it in their policy. But if there is no law that says that you've got to disclose it in this information, then the correct answer is there's no way to tell. They could be engaging in that practice because there's nothing that requires them to disclose this in their privacy policy. So that's an example where you reach the limit of what today's Gen AI tools are capable of doing. Doesn't mean that they could not improve. This chart here shows you how common these issues arise. So this is looking at seven very common, in fact, uh, sort of seven of the most common privacy questions that people have when they ask questions about their, their mobile apps. And as you can see here, right, uh, the, um, the, the bar that's being displayed, I believe this color is red, I'm slightly colorblind, but I believe this is red. This corresponds to silence. Right? So this corresponds to situation, this is looking at the privacy policies of 30 different mobile apps, right? This tells you how often, in fact, these privacy policies might be silent about some of these questions. Uh, the other interesting one is implicit positive. Implicit positive. So these are annotations from law students reading, being paid to read the text of these privacy policies, right? And so they've been able to infer that the, the app engages in this practice, but only by reasoning about hyponyms, hypernames, pseudonyms, even what we call hypo pseudonyms and hyper pseudonyms. And I will not go into the definition of these terms, but it gets very hairy very quickly. And Gen AI tools today have uh, struggled really a lot when it comes to answering those types of questions. So some of our ongoing work, and we've actually had some, some good success, but nothing published yet, hopefully sometime soon, uh, you know, has uh, basically led us to an approach where we're actually able to do a better job. This is a combination of prompt engineering and uh, you know, um, uh, few shot learning as it's called, where you provide a bit more information to these tools to help them come up with more accurate answers. What we're trying to do ultimately is we're trying to provide people with more meaningful answers. Rather than saying yes or no, we're trying to come up with answers like, this privacy policy does not indicate whether your location data is shared with advertisers. Given that under CCPA, let's say that this is someone from California asking a question, this information would have to be disclosed. It is likely that this app does not engage in this practice. Obviously, this assumes that the privacy policy is compliant, which we feel is an important thing to state, because as we know, not all privacy policies are compliant. And so we believe that those are ultimately the sorts of answers that you know, will provide the most value uh, to people. So, um, Trying to see here if there are any questions so far. Avery, uh, you've been following this. I don't see too many questions. So yeah, it's there, aren't, people, there, there aren't questions in the chat just yet. So. Okay, great. Well, I will continue. Mm -hmm. So this brings us, so I've talked about natural language processing so far, but our work extends well beyond that. Uh, and uh, in fact, a lot of our work falls under the umbrella of what we call privacy assistance. 
And so our vision here is that, you know, these regulations that I said at the beginning of this lecture, you know, are definitely helping. There are more options that are being provided to people. There are more details that are being provided to people. But yet there's this huge gap between, you know, what people are capable of doing and what is presumably offered uh, to them. And so we strongly believe that technology is needed to bridge that gap, that you can build privacy assistance, like the question answering assistance that I was just describing a minute ago, to basically help people take advantage of all this additional information, for instance, that's provided in notices, and make that information readily accessible to people so that they can just ask their question and you answer their questions based on the text of privacy policies, but without requiring them to read the text of the privacy policies. And so we've been looking also at how can we help people configure all these privacy settings that are available to them, right? The perfect example, which I think we're all familiar with, are you know these cookie pop-ups that you keep on seeing every time you go to a new website. And they ask you whether or not you know you should you would like to just restrict uh, the, the 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 installation of cookies to the absolutely necessary cookies, uh, or whether you would like to also or whether you'd be okay also with marketing cookies, cookies used for analytics, uh, etc. Is there anything more annoying than that? Most of us keep on answering you know the same way, or at least if we had the time and energy would keep on answering the same answer over and over again. In my case, it's please just give me the minimum set of cookies and that's it, I don't want more. You may have a different view, but chances are that your answers are the same. Couldn't we have a simple assistant that just keeps on communicating those answers on our behalf over and over again? And even if your answer were a little different for different categories of website, couldn't we capture this in an assistant we would know that, hey, for this category of website, this is your answer. For this other category of website, this is your answer. So we've done a lot of work that goes beyond just automatically transmitting uh, you know, answers that you've provided, but also helping people configure uh, settings and uh, for privacy that perhaps have to deal with even questions that they've not, never encountered before. We've also built technology to nudge people to engage with these settings that typically they tend to ignore. And we've also built technology in the IoT space where things are even more challenging than with mobile apps. Because in the case of mobile apps, in principle, you know that these apps are on your phone. At least you downloaded them at some point. And you know, if you open your phone, you can actually find them. You may have to scroll through a few different screens, but you can eventually find those apps. In the IT world, it's a little different because there might be a camera, a microphone, or other devices collecting data about you. And you may not even know that they're there. You may not even notice them. And you may not, and chances are you have no idea how to potentially interact with them to read a privacy policy. So nudging users is uh, an area uh, that's a little different from what I've talked about so far, but, but we've also had uh, a lot of uh, interesting results and where we've influenced our practice uh, in this space. So what you're seeing to the left here is in fact a screen that was used in an experiment we ran about 10 years ago now. Uh, we had noticed that nobody was engaging with their privacy settings. And so we decided to see whether we could nudge people. And nudging is about not forcing people to do certain things, but enticing them to perhaps, you know, consider things that they had not considered, giving them the motivation perhaps that they need to do something that ultimately will be to their benefit, right? So not engaging your privacy settings. In the short run, it may feel great. You're feeling that you're saving time. In the long run, once you find that, hey, uh, you know, there's somebody who denied me, you know, health insurance or, you know, my premium for my uh, auto insurance, uh, you know, went up, you know, auto insurance policy went up, perhaps as a result of some of these data being collected, then all of a sudden you wish you had, you know, taken the five minutes or the two minutes to modify your settings and to prevent some of these data from being collected. And so this uh, screen that you see to the left is a real screen that a real user saw in this study. In this study, I think we recruited, I think it was about 40 people. And uh, we uh, presented them with technology that uh, did not exist at the time. Uh, I mean, some of these things exist today and might look very familiar. At the time, this was not available. We had actually, uh, we had to uh, jailbreak Android uh, to make this technology available to users. Uh, and, um, and so we had a real user whose data had been collected 5,398 times. And this became the title actually of, of the paper we eventually published at Kai, which is one of the uh, our top HCI conferences, your location has been shared 5,398 times. Uh, 
as always, for those of you who submit papers to scientific conferences, we're actually a little late in analyzing our data when we pick the title of this paper. And so we had only analyzed data for a couple of subjects, and we thought that 5398 50, times was a big number. By the time we finished the analysis after submitting the abstract and submitted the paper, we had actually discovered that was actually the user whose data had been collected the least in that experiment. And so these were days where, uh, and this still happens today, uh, your data can get collected at a very, very high level of frequency. So in this particular case, Groupon was, I think, collecting your location data every two minutes, even if just running in the background. And so when you show a screen like this to people, all of a sudden, even if they had never engaged with their settings, all of a sudden, they're very tempting to take a look. It's like 5,398 times. Hmm, that's a little surprising. Maybe there's something I should change. And you make it super easy for them to directly land on the screen where they can modify their settings. All of a sudden, you see some very significant changes in behavior. I'm not going to go into all the details of this study, but we basically show that users were extremely receptive to these uh, notifications, viewed them as being extremely beneficial and informative, with a large number of them following the advice, going and looking at their settings, and in fact, restricting many of their settings and reporting being very happy with those changes, even if you check with them several days later and in fact, entice them to take another look and perhaps revise their settings. They would not necessarily, they would, most of them would not modify anything. And so eventually in uh, 2019, for instance, iOS introduced technology that's very similar. You might recognize, you know, this is uh, uh, iOS 13, uh, but other organizations, Facebook actually has a, uh, uh, introduced uh, somewhat similar types of nudges as well. Uh, and so this eventually caught on. It always takes a few years before uh, industry uh, you know, adopts some of these things. But we've actually gone beyond that. Uh, if you look at the number of privacy settings that you've got to configure on your cell phone, it's a pretty large number. As I've mentioned earlier, most users have between 50 and 100 apps on their cell phones. And these apps have you know, two or three different privacy settings. So before you know it, you do the math and you realize that you might have to configure maybe 150, 200 different privacy settings. So even if I nudge you, who's got really the time to do this? And so we ask ourselves to what extent we could potentially help people uh, configure their settings, not by doing this on their behalf, which would take away this you know, obviously super important concept of agency and control, which is really part of privacy. So we don't want to make those decisions for you most of the time, but we thought, hey, perhaps we can give you recommendations. And so even using super simple machine learning techniques like clustering, we're actually able to identify a small number of profiles that enabled us to make many predictions, extremely accurate predictions about the types of settings different users would want. And so that led us to eventually publishing an app in the Google Play Store where people were asked five different questions about their, uh, you know, how they felt about different scenarios and based on their answers, would then recommend that they change some of their settings. So what you see here on the right-hand side is basically recommendations. So we not change the settings on their behalf, but we tell them very quickly that, hey, these are things that don't seem to be consistent with your preferences. You might want to review that. And we gave them the option of modifying each one of these recommendations they wanted to, or to accept them in bulk, or to accept them after modifying some of the recommendation. That, again, proved extremely successful. We did uh, a bunch of pilots uh, prior to releasing this in the Google Play Store, and people reported that this made their lives a lot easier. They landed with settings they felt a lot more comfortable with. Even if we nudged them later on to modify their settings, they reported not modifying most of their settings because they felt much more comfortable with the recommendations that we had made and that they had accepted. So that's another example in which you can actually help users. And we believe that this has a lot of potential as well, though nobody has actually implemented this just yet. Some companies I'm not going to name uh, have actually implemented uh, these things and uh, got very close to deploying them. But then uh, marketing got involved and decided that, uh, you know, they were concerned too many people start opting out of things that enable them to collect a lot of data. And they decided not to proceed with that. And I'm not going to name uh, some of these companies. So this is, you know, what we've done in the mobile space. But over the next few minutes before wrapping up, I'd like to briefly you know, ask the question about, well, how about IoT? How about the Internet of Things? As I've mentioned earlier, well, on mobile phones, it's still relatively easy. In principle, you're the one who downloaded most of these apps. You should know that they're there. You can find them. They show up on your screen. And you can potentially access all these settings. In you know, IoT scenarios, like 
video cameras and video analytics, right? The state of the art is this sign, right? And I'm not going to do a show of hands because I think I know the answer, but you know, how many of you are likely to notice this sign? I mean, some of us sometimes do know this, but often you do not. And, you know, can you tell based on this sign whether this includes facial recognition? Maybe you can, but I certainly cannot. Uh, what about facial expression or, you know, uh, uh, what about, uh, you know, your, your mood, for instance? Uh, can you tell for how long this data is going to be retained? How do you opt in or opt out? If there's a requirement to opt out, like in California, for instance, uh, you need to be able to opt out of this uh, uh, collection if some of these data is used for marketing uh, purposes or being sold to third parties. And, uh, you know, more generally, can you tell whether this is GDPR compliant? Obviously, here in, in, in Canada, can you tell whether this is PIPEDA compliant? No, you cannot, right? And so there's clearly a big gap in this space. And uh, when you look at these scenarios, and again, we've carried out very extensive experiments to say, well, maybe it doesn't matter. You know, maybe people are okay with these scenarios. It's actually extremely complex, just like the show of hands we did early on. You're not supposed to look at this slide and read all the text. It will drive you crazy. I'll briefly summarize what you're supposed to see from all these different colors. What these different colors mean is that, again, the way that people feel about these scenarios has a lot to do with what is being collected, whether that's being collected is identifiable or not, for how long it's being retained, for what purpose it's being retained, and so on. Uh, if you look at concern levels and whether or not people are comfortable with some of these scenarios, the scenarios where people re uh, report the least concern, it doesn't mean that people are not concerned, all these scenarios, there is some level of concern, or the least surprise, those are the surveillance scenarios, the, the scenarios that have to do with security. The scenarios that people tend to object the most uh, two are scenarios about work productivity, like your employer monitoring your productivity, potentially firing you if you're not productive enough. There are actually some companies, as you might know, that engage in these practices. Health predictions. Uh, people very, feel that those things are very creepy, and they would certainly want to be notified about these things. They would potentially want to be able to opt out of these uh, practices. But there's no way of doing that today. Right? So uh, those are obviously some of the challenges that need to be overcome in, in this space. Before you know it also, you just think about the number of IoT devices you are going to come in the vicinity of during the course of the day. The number of notifications you would have to be given could be very quickly overwhelming. Uh, the number of mechanisms that you know you would have to interact with to opt in or opt out, if these mechanisms were even available, most of the time they're not, could be overwhelming as well. So there are clearly a number of different requirements that are uh, that that need to be addressed in this space. One is building technology that makes these uh, notices and the ability to exercise choices more readily accessible. Another, in order for this type of technology to work, is to probably require some standardization. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute, but this would include standardized ways for communicating these practices, standardized ways for exposing APIs where you can obtain opt out, request deletion of your data, taxonomies of data practices, and so on, so that perhaps. Uh, you know, you could actually configure your preferences once, and these preferences could be communicated on your behalf every time you run into the same types of uh, scenarios. So we've actually built uh, uh, an infrastructure to deal with this at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, this infrastructure has been deployed now for a few years, and uh, it consists of two different components. There's a portal where people who deploy these IoT devices can go and actually declare the presence of their device, where these, device, these devices collect data, what data practices they engage in, and what privacy controls they want to make available to people. And then we've got an app that's available both in the Android uh, Google Play Store and the iOS App Store that people can download, and then they can discover what's around them and actually obtain opt out request deletion of their data, and so on. And so uh, this is, for instance, what the mobile app looks like. If I had more time, I would tell you, I would actually click on this link and I would show you videos of how this works. Uh, this app has been downloaded by about 40,000 people at this point, so not a huge number, uh, but this is what the screens look like. And uh, and we're hosting about close to 150,000 descriptions of IoT systems in about 25, 26 different countries. So we've actually worked with a number of different entities. For instance, we worked with the city of Amsterdam, where uh, people can discover 13, 1,300 different sensors that uh, the city has deployed, sensing traffic, looking at uh, not just pedestrian traffic or uh, you know car traffic but also traffic uh, boats actually there are lots of uh, you know ship uh, i mean there are lots of canals in amsterdam so that's also something that they're monitoring and enabling people to discover these 
these different sensors and to identify what data they're being collect that they're collecting for what purpose and so on. Uh, I will not have the time to discuss this slide because I'd like to make this interactive, but this is a way of showing you that the same technology that we developed for mobile apps, where we could recommend to people uh, how they would want to configure different settings, the same technology could be used to actually group people in different clusters. Small number of clusters can go a long way in providing extremely uh, reliable recommendations uh, to people. Not that we want to turn these recommendations into automated decisions. Ethically speaking, that would be completely wrong. Instead, we strongly believe in making recommendations, but allowing people to retain uh, control over the ultimate decision so that they can decide whether they like the recommendation, whether they want to change the recommendation, and what have you. So we're getting to the end of my talk. I'd like to briefly summarize the key points I was getting across. I know I've covered quite a bit of ground here. So number one, this is a space that's moving pretty fast. And there are lots of very good regulations that have been introduced that are really moving in the right direction. Uh, not just in terms of you know, requiring people to disclose more details about what they collect and for what purpose, giving people more controls over uh, that data, but uh, also much steeper penalties for not complying with these laws, right? So uh, the biggest uh, uh, compliance fines are actually here in the US, $5 billion, Facebook, Cambridge Analytica. There's a settlement right now with Google Chrome, also in the US for $5 billion. In Europe, GDPR has led to, I think, one fine of about 1.2 or 1.3 billion euros. Uh, Meta again, so often these big fines. Amazon has been slapped, I think, with 750 million euros. So clearly this has become a lot more serious. The requirements are a lot more stringent. And yet, in the absence of better technology and even you know, more prescriptive uh, regulatory requirements, there remains a huge gap between what these regulations require and what people can realistically be expected to do. And so a lot of our work has been to develop technologies to try to overcome this gap, but also as we do this work, to identify areas where there's a limit to how far technology can go, and as a result, informing uh, people working in public policy on changes that hopefully they can uh, incorporate in future regulations. We talk on a regular basis to the FTC, uh, the California AG, uh, the EDPS in Europe, and other regulatory agencies. And uh, it's nice to know that uh, they like to listen and they pay attention to what we're doing, and they're using even tools that, uh, that we have uh, developed. So I give you an overview of different types of technologies that we've developed over time. And uh, you know, one of the interesting points here is that obviously AI in the context of privacy is often depicted as the bad guy, AI and machine learning, right? It's all about collecting more data about you and deriving things and inferring things about you that perhaps you don't feel comfortable uh, seeing inferred. Uh, in truth, we believe and we've shown through our research that AI and ML can also be part of the solution. There we see you know, very delicate ethical considerations that you need to pay attention to. At the end of the day, a lot of our work involved carrying out human subject studies. We try to really see how people feel, whether they view some of these technologies and the way in which we configure them as being beneficial or whether or not we need to modify some of these configurations. And so obviously human subject studies, really understanding how people react and respond to these technologies is a big part of doing things right. And not something that's fully reflected today in our regulations. Uh, examples of technologies that I presented that require further regulation in my view include obviously communication of controls uh, that users are presumably being given access to. I think there's a big need to standardize these things. I've mentioned the, 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 the cookies that get installed in your browser. I've shown you the examples with IoT resources collecting your data. If we had ways of standardizing this, we could actually deploy technologies like the ones I've described more readily and the world would be a better place in my view. And so I'm gonna thank you now for your attention and I'd be happy to uh, I'll take uh, your questions as well or, or chat with you. Thank you so much. Um, this is a wonderful talk on such an important topic and it is clear that you've already made the world a better place. <laughs> Thank you for this work. Um, so we'll move into the question and answer period now, um, just as kind of instructions for the audience. Um, Thank you, Luke, uh, do as Luke has done and use the raise hand function to um, get into the queue to ask questions. And if you're able to turn on your camera, that'd be great um, just to maximize engagement. And when it's your turn to speak, our team will send you an unmute request and then you can um, unmute and ask your question. <laughs> 
Okay, so we will start here with Luke. Go ahead. Uh, hi, hi, Norman. Thank you so much, um, Luke Stark. Um, I'm an information media studies at Western. Um, I, 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 I'm a big fan of Laurie's work. I'm a big fan of privacy by design work. Um, I have, I think, I think this is all extremely useful. I, ha I have two questions. Um, one question is your um, perspective on the on the regulation of user experience design, right? So one of the things that the FTC has begun to explore in the last couple of years, right, is whether some forms of UX and UI are intrinsically unfair or deceptive. And I think one of the things that I get out of your work, right, is that is that that's the case, but that unless there's large scale mandates to change the design of these systems, right, the, the voluntary opt-in stuff is great. You know, it's it's only going to be a fraction, you know, of of the people uh, who use these technologies. The the, the default is going to be the thing that will will have the biggest impact. So I wonder if you have any perspectives on that. And the other question was is um, drawing on some work by Michael Veal, who's a, a, a UCL privacy scholar, has been doing recently on the concerns or that he has is that um, you know the companies are becoming more and more adept at doing inference using personal data without that data being um, uh, being uh, I guess publicly shared. In, in in other words, right. They're complying with all the various personal uh, personal data regulations under the GDPR, but they're but they're doing analysis on the phones, or they're doing analysis in ways that still allow them to make quite granular inferences and predictions about humans. So I wonder if if you know where where your work relates to that. Yeah. So um, your first question had to do with what people refer to as dark patterns uh, these days, and so dark patterns in a nutshell are patterns that can take many different shapes and forms, but that are intended to get people to take some actions that ultimately are not to their benefit. So for instance, dark patterns used in the context of cookies, where perhaps you know agreeing to having all the cookies installed in your browser is a lot easier than actually configuring the different choices where you have to explicitly reject some of the cookies that by default might be installed on, on, on in your browser. Um, and so uh, these dark patterns can take the, the, the shape of uh, processes that require more steps for you to potentially opt out of some of the practices, defaults that are by, you know, that are going to be privacy invasive. Europe doesn't allow for those types of defaults in the US we're a lot more permissive when it comes to that. It also includes just highlighting uh, a button uh, you know, uh, that itself has an impact on how people behave. So we've done a lot of work in that space. Uh, for instance, going back to, uh, you know, maybe 2015 or so, where we looked at uh, nine different ways of disclosing the fact that a mobile app collects your location information and showing that, uh, you know, depending on how this is worded, people are going to respond very, very differently. I mean, we're talking about statistically significant differences in people's responses, just based on how far you go in telling them the implications of their decisions. So it's one thing to say, hey, this app will collect your location. It's another thing to say, well, this app will collect your location every time you do this, but you can go as far as saying, this app will be able to infer where you live, uh, or even based on where you live, this app might be able to infer how much money you make, because different neighborhoods, people make different amounts of money. And so uh, people are, uh, extremely sensitive to these types of manipulations. And as a result, it's very hard to define exactly what a dark pattern is, uh, at least if you rely just purely on text. But there are regulations. I mean, I think you mentioned GDPR, you mentioned CCPA. Those regulations explicitly have provisions, very short and very vague and very aspirational, but they do have provisions that explicitly mention dark patterns, non-manipulative. If you look at the notion of consent, for instance, in GDPR, it's actually extremely specific when they talk about not just explicit, but informed, and again, provisions against manipulation. From my perspective, everything that I've seen in my research indicates that, uh, number one, so I'm actually, we're actually developing right now a, um, a, uh, uh, a new framework, a new methodology to help companies that want to do things right. It's very tempting, obviously, not to do things right or to say, well, I think I'm complying with the law and then you push the envelope. So I believe there's a need, number one, for design patterns in this space. 
right? So companies that can afford that cannot afford to run human subject studies, right? At least tell them this is manipulative. End of the story, right? Like you know, using a larger font, you know, a, a particular color to highlight something, forcing people to go through more clicks if they want to opt out of certain things. All those things are pretty easy to identify in the form of design patterns. I think ultimately uh, that has to be included in the form of best, best practices, the interpretation of these laws, you know, increasingly, you know, involve looking at what is best practice today, right? If everybody knows that, you know, if you're going to use a specific color or a larger font or you make it more difficult for users to do this, you're clearly manipulative in your approach, then that might be enough. Ultimately, would like perhaps these regulations to more explicitly acknowledge these best practices. And these best practices are not going to fall from the sky. At the end of the day, you've got to carry out research with real people and show that, hey, you know, you change this. And all of a sudden, right, uh, people start, you know, doing things very, very differently. And therefore, it's not acceptable to do this. You may claim that, you know, you just change the color a little bit. Uh, we work with uh, the California AG of, uh, a few years ago. They eventually adopted our design. Uh, Laurie was in the lead on that in this case. Obviously, everything that I talked about today, I've been in the lead on, but we collaborate on, on many things. Uh, we we uh, ended up designing the, 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 the logo and the text that's used and that's required now by the California law, the California Privacy Law, CCPA, to tell people that they've got some privacy choices and to opt out of the sale of their information. That work was uh, actually a huge amount of work, right? So we had we piloted a number of different designs for those of you who might have seen that paper. And then after doing all the work, we sent the Cali AG the results of our work to say, this is the one. And they said, thank you so much. We really appreciate all the hard work. This is really impressive. And by the way, we made this slight change and we're going to go ahead with this slight change of the work, but thank you so much for your work. This is all based on your work. And we said, hold on a sec here. That very slight change might actually be very meaningful, but actually not in a good way. And we tested it and we showed that that slight change where they basically changed a little bit the design, a little bit the color, right? All of a sudden people perceive this as being completely different. And so there's nothing like running human subject studies. The design patterns will only go so far but design patterns can go a long way, I think, in informing uh, practice for many companies that cannot afford to run these human subject studies. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. All right, good. Maybe we should give somebody else a chance to ask a question. That's a really interesting answer. Um, so next is Dave. Dave, if you're able to unmute. Yeah, okay, great. All right, can you hear me? Hi, Ken, hello, how are you? Good, thanks. All right, so um, so I'm calling in from the middle of Silicon Valley, about three miles from Apple, about five miles from Google. And I've been in the industry for 34 years, so I have some insight, uh, hardware and software side, on what actually goes on. Um, and I've already posted my question in writing, but uh, um, I, I this, this topic of privacy comes up a lot. And... I'm always amazed at how people are not aware that whenever you go to a web page, even if you're incognito, so no cookies, everything blocked, even if you use DuckDuckGo, doesn't matter. Most there's something called a web fingerprint because browsers are two way. They're giving all kinds of um, graphics and formatting things to make it work. It's functional stuff, but it makes you completely unique. <laughs> the yes. server that receives your web page request to display the web page knows your browser from anybody else's browser yes. to within like one in a million or one in 10 million at least or better. Yeah. And and that's without even your IP address. So as soon as they've got your IP address, which they have to have, otherwise it doesn't work, um, they know who you are. Yes. So, so the sh ship has sailed. I mean, the only way to actually be private is not to use the internet. Um, so I've posted the link. You can go to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They have a, an experiment you can do right now. Anyone on the call can do this. Um, and they'll, they'll do it. a trial fingerprint for you and show you how unique you are. So I'm really not, I, I don't know um, the point of all of these laws and anything. Um, it's not going to stop anyone tracking anything. There's always a way to get around it. So what's your reaction to that? Yes. Well, number one, you're correct that uh, today, 
right? Uh, it's very easy to fingerprint people. And, you know, we look, for instance, at, uh, you know, what Google is going to do when they drop cookies. And at the end of the day, you know, they're going to, you can still really identify uh, many people. Uh, you know, in fact, I think 100% of people pretty much can be re-identified or at least a very large percentage. There's just so much data out there. So I, I don't disagree with you that the situation is very challenging uh, today. And I believe that, uh, you know, it, it might very well remain challenging for the foreseeable future, but it doesn't mean that we cannot push back against that. Uh, and so I believe that uh, uh, the regulatory requirements that you have in place today already are forcing uh, actors to be, uh, you know, a lot more rigorous in terms of what they're collecting, disclosing what they're collecting, how it can be used, right? And it's not just about technology. The fact that something can be done technically doesn't mean that you're allowed to do it, right? So these disclosure requirements basically say, I don't care if technically speaking, you're allowed to do this. If your privacy policy doesn't state that you're doing it, and if the regulation under which you're falling you know, requires you to disclose these practices, then you're not allowed to do it, right? And, and you may need to obtain consent in order to do it. And so there is also that aspect of these regulations. And so if these companies engage in these practices because they technically can, but you know they've not obtained consent to do these things and the laws require them to obtain consent, then they are in trouble and we have tools to go after them. Does it mean that every single instance where this is going to happen is going to be caught? Today, it's very tough for regulators to keep up, right? They're, they're lacking the tools to do these things. And, you know, people like us and our, you know, others, EFF is a good organization that does a lot of work in this space too. We're trying to develop tools to identify these things, to raise awareness, uh, to automatically identify these practices, and then, you know, trying to help regulators so that they are more likely to fall on those people who engage in practices they're not they're not supposed to engage in. Does this answer your question? Okay, you're muted right now. Maybe have to resend the yeah. unmute request. So, so now I, I think it actually misses the point completely. Okay. Uh, maybe I didn't make it clearly. Um, the, the company receiving a web request doesn't need to track my name and my address in order to know my demographic, in order to market to me. They can just assign me a number and call it one, two, three, four, five. And they know my age, they know my shoe size, they know everything I search all day long, and they can market away happily. So it doesn't, it doesn't infringe any privacy law on the planet. planet. Well, that, uh, that's what is actually happening in the industry. Well, <laughs> they don't care what your name is. <laughs> right. No, I'm quite familiar with that. Uh, yeah. But not what, what you're saying here is not necessarily entirely true. And it depends on, on the regulations that are going to apply. I think, you know, if all they do is identify who you are based on only data that they've collected about you and nobody else, and they've collected this only through their own properties, then under most regulations, uh, you know, that will probably be okay. Under some regulations, perhaps they need consent. But I think the scenario that you outlined was a little different. And maybe I'm just reading between the lines. But it sounded also that some of the data that they might have about you was acquired from third parties. And now all of a sudden, they learn more about you because that data was being acquired. The regulations that have, are coming out, and it's not uniform by any stretch of the imagination, but the regulations that are coming out are trying to place some restrictions, are trying to increase people's awareness, are trying to enable people to potentially request the, the, the deletion of some of that data. And so I'm not saying it's perfect, far from that. But I don't think that uh, you know we're not accomplishing anything. I think there is movement in the right direction. It's a journey. It's not a destination. I don't think privacy will ever be 100%. It could be the case that it's only going to get worse overall, right? like in security. There's a lot of research being done in security. We're making a ton of progress. And yet, every year, the situation is worse. Privacy could very well be one of those. It's clear that we're up against some very challenging technologies. And there's a whole design space of ways of invading people's privacy. And regulation is playing catch up in many ways. So I don't disagree with that part. Does this do a better job at answering your question? Thanks so much. I think because we have uh, two more people, oh, three. Uh, let's move on to the next. Uh, we've only got 10 more minutes, if that's all right. We'll move on to uh, David Quisby. Um, Uchenna Ukwu is next. And then we might be able to fit in James Sandhu. Uh, 
I cannot hear you right now. Um, that actually might be you're unmuted, but the audio source might be might be the I'm not very good issue. at not very good at lip reading. We can give you another minute, David, to sort out the audio source. We'll go to Uchenna Ugu and we'll come right back to you, David. Okay. All right. Uchenna, are you ready? Yep. Okay. Hello. Great. All right. I think I'm unmuted now. Thanks. Thanks, Norman. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, it was a very eye opening. What I'd like to ask about the privacy assistant technology is how affordable will it be, especially for the SMEs, the small and medium enterprises that are starting up? Because um, the presumption is that if they need to put in these things in place and also the end users, it's going to cost more money. It might discourage some of the newer startups from being able to say, okay, let's start up those that are at a, at a smaller scale than Google and Microsoft and all the rest and say, okay, let's start up and then we have to add this again to the numerous burdens of rules we've got to obey. So is it affordable? And if it's not, you know, what can be done about it? From a so there are, perspective? Well, thank you for asking this question. It's a very interesting question. And, and there are multiple uh, sides to the answer I need to give you. So number one, you're raising the question of who should be deploying this technology? And, and your question assumed that the companies that collect your data would be responsible for deploying those privacy assistants. That's certainly one possibility, but uh, my preferred scenario, and I'm not saying this is the only scenario, so you might have companies that decide that they wanna have their own privacy assistant supporting, for instance, question answering functionality like the one I described. My preferred scenario is a scenario where the privacy assistant is offered by a neutral third party that only cares about your privacy. And, and perhaps they need to make money. I would like that third party to be in charge of my privacy assistant because I think they're going to be more neutral, ideally. right? I think they're going to help me do a better job. They're, they're going to help me understand what you know is written between the lines in that privacy policy. They're going to help me interpret silence. As a company, right, if, if my privacy policy is silent about some issues because my attorneys have said, you don't need to disclose that. The laws don't require you to, 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 to say what you're doing in that regard. They don't require you to be that specific. Well, a privacy assistant that's, you know, working for a third party whose interest is solely, you know, my, my well-being, my privacy, my understanding of what's going on, that assistant, you know, can be developed in such a way that's going to actually read between the lines and tell me how to interpret the silence. So the signs that I'm talking about, just along the lines of the example I gave, uh, of you know, a few slides beyond before the end of my talk. Another advantage potentially of this privacy assistant is that it could then you know reuse some of my preferences across multiple websites, multiple apps, right? And there are very very strong correlations, as it turns out, right? So. Uh, you know, the way you feel about sharing your location with some entities and, and having that, you know, information being shared with advertisers probably is not going to change an awful lot as you move from one app to another or even to website. So there is that advantage uh, also. Uh, now, there's a final part to the question that you've asked, and I know that all these answers are very long, but there is still a burden potentially for uh, the uh, people who collect the data, the so-called uh, data controllers, if you use the terminology of, of the European General Data Protection Regulation. And, and those requirements will have to do with these additional requirements that ideally, you know, I would like regulators to impose. Uh, and, uh, you know, occasionally regulators listen to us. It typically takes many years, but we're seeing some progress. So, for instance, here in the U.S., until a year ago, there was a, a proposal in Congress that had bipartisan support that was known as ADPPA, uh, the uh, American Data Protection Privacy Act. And it almost passed until California decided to block it. They didn't like it because it was going to be preemptive, preventing people in California from passing their own laws. But that actually had provisions for uh, some of the standards that I'm advocating. Standards, for instance, to communicate choices that are being made available uh, to people and chance, uh, standards for people to communicate back their choices. Right. So, if you, for instance, if you look at CCPA, the California Privacy Protection Act, right, it's got this opt-out choice. Well, right now, it's a very tedious process to actually take advantage of that choice. There is no reason why there couldn't be a protocol that would enable me to communicate these choices if I move from one website to another. If my preferences are pretty much always the same, 
right? I could actually store that preference once on my in my assistant on my phone, for instance, or in my browser, and that could be communicated over and over again, sig significantly reducing user burden, obviously. And so in this case, the burden would be on the data collector in the sense that they would need to know offer APIs that are capable of processing those signals, communicating those practices in a standardized manner, and handling my request in a standardized manner. So there would still be a cost, right? So uh, you know that's obviously typical of regulations. They never come for free. Okay, I think, so we've only got four minutes left. We do have a hard stop at 2 p.m. Um, but Jamie, if you have a quick version of that, uh, your question. Oh, sorry, David. Uh, I don't know if David's still. It could always be whoever com comes in first. Um, yeah, see David. Okay, okay. Jamie, go. Um, yeah, thanks for pro providing the time, Norman. It was a really good discussion. It made me wish that it was something that was more widely broadcast for the general public to be listening in on. I think it would be very effective. Um, I did feel that your presentation, though, kind of focused more in a corporate perspective, expectations on corporations to do certain things to ensure privacy is kind of upheld. Um, and while governments are good at producing regulation that are very robust and very detailed in the interests of the public, um, how much expectation should we put on government ourselves to join in on this um, conversation and also participate more in detail. Um, for instance, a simple example, what is a cookie? Uh, the government could simply produce a kind of educational campaign, whether that's through advertisements, to provide the general public with a base level understanding of these things that they're interacting with, rather than leaving it onto the companies themselves. So. I guess that's my question to you in, in the work you've been doing, the engagement you've been doing with stakeholders. While government is interested in listening to this conversation and learning from you, how much of that interest actually translates into actual um, you know, real world um, deployment of educational tools? And I know you decided to not to skip the educational component of all this because it is a huge topic, but I do feel it is the, the, the pillars that really hold it all in balance. So um, you're actually pointing to exactly the right slide I was going to mention. So clearly you, you, you noticed that at the beginning of the talk, I said there are three different dimensions. So a lot of our technical work, which is what I spend most of my time talking about today, is actually saying, well, you know, let's take the world as it exists today and see if we can build technologies that help overcome the gap between, you know, what regulations offer and what, you know, and how people interpret these regulations and what people are capable of doing. And so... That's you know where we spend most of our time. But as we do this work, we can help but notice that, boy, this would be so much easier, right? If we had, for instance, standards, if we had those types of requirements. And so as we you know share our results with regulators and with industry, we try to get industry to you know adopt some of our technologies when it's relevant. And we've had some success, obviously, at, at you know doing that. Uh, we try to get regulators to think about some of the things we're discovering and trying to influence you know, future regulations. And we've had some success in that space. It takes many years. And it's not, it's never something that we do on our own, right? So we're part of a community. You know, sometimes we're the first ones to mention certain things. Sometimes others mention certain things first. And then others do more experiments to further substantiate what you've discovered. And then over time, you know, regulators start thinking that, hey, maybe there's a point there. And maybe the political climate is such that some of these things can find a way into, into new laws and regulations. And, and you know, the speed at which these things move can be extremely slow. Sometimes, you know, it's possible that some of the things we do will never be adopted. I've got no idea. But we try to operate on all these fronts. And yes, I cannot, you know, I can only agree with you that education is super important. Education will never get us there 100%. Uh, but uh, we do actually a lot of work. So just uh, two weeks ago, Privacy Day, right, January 28th, we organized a big event here in Pittsburgh at uh, the public libraries to educate the public at large and you know show them how to uh, actually do exactly what one of the previous uh, uh, people who asked me a question was talking about, showing them how easy they are to be re-identified. We use a QR code that people could scan with their cell phone, showing them how unique their cell phone was and, and the likelihood they could be re-identified and, and those types of things. We help them configure their browsers. We help them understand if all these things are needed and you need to increasingly, I mean, the. The world is becoming increasingly complex, right? So 
Uh, we have experiments where we've shown, you know, how many people don't even understand incognito browsing, right? Uh, and, and those kinds of things. So things that you would believe, you know, are understood and yet people don't understand. And, you know, that was actually the basis for that uh, Google Chrome settlement recently, people not realizing that cookies could still be installed and, and all these kinds of things. So I think I, I violently agree with everything that you've said. And I don't know whether I've really answered the question or not here, but hopefully I said something interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, what a wonderful presentation. Um, so let's all thank Professor Sade uh, 5,398 times. Uh, a round of applause, uh, Zoom applause. And um, so thanks everyone for joining us uh, for this event. And also come back next week, uh, February 14th. We will welcome John Kleinberg, Professor of Computer Science at Cornell. Uh, John is giving a talk entitled The Challenge of Understanding What Users Want inconsistent preferences and engagement optimization. So, and on Valentine's again, Day. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, thanks again, Professor Sade. We've all enjoyed this very much. And um, to everyone, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you so much.